Mm-hmm. Uh, Jesus didn't have a problem with people that's in the streets. He had a problem with religious people. How can I help anybody when I'm not even when I was not even able to help my own son? I would never do that. I would never do that. And I became that in a matter of minutes when they took my pain pills away. And I said, I'm not where I want to be. But thank God I'm not what I used to be. Ugh. This is Faith in Your Recovery. I am Randy Davis. Welcome to the battle. His name is Joe Henry. Good morning, Joe. Hey, good morning, Randy Davis. How you doing? Wonderful. Welcome. We're glad to have you as a part of our podcast. Thanks for taking the time to join us. Appreciate you having me. I'm glad to be here. Excited about it. Awesome. Let's kind of begin. Tell us a little of your background. Introduce us to Joe of old, or maybe I should say of young, okay? Back in those uh, school days. Tell us about you. Yeah, absolutely. So, um... I was born and raised in Richmond, Indiana. Still, still live there. Um, Red Devil. Um, you know, I know that uh, some of those Muncie Central Bearcats and Anderson Indians might not like that, but um, hey, let me throw something in there. Our next guest is actually a Muncie Central Bearcat to play ball there, and awesome. here we are in Indian Country. So go ahead. Right on. Um, yeah, no, I grew up there. Uh, I played ball growing up. Played. Uh, baseball, football at Richmond High School, and then I went on to play a little bit at Earlham. Um, that was a big part of, of me and who I was growing up is, you know, being an athlete and playing ball and um, still have a lot of great relationships with the people that um, that I grew up with and that played with in high school and college. And, you know, that's actually how I came to, to be at, at groups um, was one of the guys I became really close with in in college um he was working there and and thought i'd be a good fit to come on and board and work there and so um you know it's been it's been a a really good experience to be part of um a company that's helping people and finding ways to bring resources to people that otherwise a lot of times don't have them um yeah so like i said live in richmond got i've got two boys and two stepdaughters um, I've got an older adopted daughter that's a junior at IU. Um, my boys are 16 and 12. My stepdaughters are 14 and 15. So uh, Your hands aren't full, nor your schedule. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, no, I'll be at uh, Eastern Hancock tonight watching my uh, oldest son play basketball. He plays for Northeastern. So, so yeah, so like, and sports is still a big part of, of, of everything that we do. So that's a good time in life, getting to celebrate the kids and their joys and excitement and be there in those moments where the game doesn't go their way. That's right. And, and just being so proud of them for putting in the work to be there in the first place, you know, teaching them those lessons about, you know, taking advantage of opportunities and, you know, it's what you put in is what you get back out. That, that's been that's been a fun lesson to convey to them, you know, to, to help them realize. Yeah. You know, we learn in sports, uh, sometimes you win, sometimes the score's not in your favor. That pretty well parallels life. That's Share right. with us a little bit of, you know, your past and any of the struggles you've had or battles you've had to fight in life. Yeah. So, you know, I've, uh, you know, not I'm not in recovery myself, but I've got some I've got a really close friend that's in the battle right now. Um, you know, somebody that I played ball with and, you know, he had an unfortunate injury and and, uh, you know, became he fell into addiction through that. And, you know, and and, and now um, he's in a good place, uh, I think right now. I mean, obviously, every day is is something new and a new challenge for everybody. Um, you know, me personally. One of the things that uh, I would say tested me at some point was uh, uh, when my dad's father passed away. That was a little tough for me. It was the first time that I had really experienced loss. Um, you know, it was something that um, I don't think I was ready for at the time and um, really made me question some things. And, and, and it was uh, when you look back on it, it was a good thing. It was a good thing to have to question and, and work through that and understand that, they're, that I was wrong. You know, like they, that maybe I was wrong about some things, and I feel like I had some. I found my faith um, through some. You know, you might look at it as unfortunate. It was some, some circumstances that happened through uh, of my marriage and um, and and that ending. But it uh, there were some things that happened that were unexplainable, right? Like the only way you could explain it was through the Lord, and yes, so yes. Um, 
and, and I've held on to that ever since. Like I know and, and still have tough times every once in a while, and that's um, something you always fall back on. You know that it's there. You know that it's real because of those tough experiences and those tough times. And so, um, you know, that's been something that uh, has has been really powerful for me. It's, it drives me to just keep that relationship going. Sure. As I think back to our story of Better Life, Brianna's Hope, I think to the passing of Brianna D. Batiste at the age of 25 through addiction-related circumstances. And the scripture that we most often draw upon within all of that's Genesis 50, verse 20, where it speaks about what you intended for evil, God will use for good, and he's going to use it to save lives. So even in those dark moments, mm-hmm. there's a light that can come through, and we may not see it then, yeah. but down the road, we recognize where that strength came from. And though it wasn't a part of the the plan per se, it was a part of life's purpose. Yep. And that's what moves us to a higher level, isn't it? No, 100%. I mean, I think it's it's taught me to look for that. Like, what is, okay, something is rough's going on. What else do I need to be looking for? Like, what else do I need to look, look that's coming out of this that can be a positive? Or, yeah, yeah. You know, I think that that was a great lesson for me to learn. And it's something that I try to convey on to my kids and my stepdaughters. And, you know, like, yeah, something rough's going on right now, but what's that leading to or what's it trying to teach you? Exactly. Uh, it can make you or break you. It can be a stepping stone or a stumbling block, and you're going to choose how you're going to use it or it's going to use you. Exactly. And that's not going to be in a favorable way if that's the case. You mentioned briefly there having a friend who struggled with his addiction issues, and you don't have to give us details he wouldn't want to you to sure, give, sure. but tell us how that worked on you and how that touched you, and I'm going to guess maybe created a part of where you are today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was actually after I'd started with groups. I was not in the same role that I'm at with the that I'm in with the company right now, but I was in a in a hiring role um, and and opening some offices, and I was actually opening the Richmond office, and um, you know I, this was a friend that. Uh, that I had already, he had already struggled with addiction and, and come out of it and come out of it well, you know, um, was, had gotten married, was doing well, had, you know, um, felt like he had passed that part of his life. Um, and so, you know, he's having a little bit of trouble with, with the the wife and, and was trying to find a job. And I said, Hey, I've got a job as an office manager um, I think someday you'd be an amazing counselor. You've, you've, you've taken that journey already. I think this is something you could do. Uh, would you be interested? And so we worked through that. Um, and he came on board and, and, and it's during that first week, those first four days of having him on that I realized, okay, there's still something not, not right. Yes. Some, some struggle with being where you're supposed to be and showing up and, and those things. And so that opportunity to, to help out didn't last very long, and then things kind of took a turn uh, for the negative. Um, and it, and it, the experience I had was just not the same person that I knew. The, through, through, the, through the end of that, of that uh, opportunity, I found out that there was just a lot more going on. Um, and so it helped me. It was really the first experience I'd had with that, with, with somebody that I knew closely and knew them as this person, but then they they kind of showed themselves through their struggle and through their addiction being a, not the same that they were. Um, and so it it helped me understand that it wasn't him, you know, it wasn't wasn't who he was that w- that was causing him to to be that way or struggle like that. It were all the things that were going on with him. The addiction had kind of taken the place of logic and reason, um, and so. It, it very much helped me understand that you've you've got to help people. You can't you can't punish them for these things that are going on. You got to help them work through it, um, help them figure it out. Um, unfortunately, at the time I wasn't able to, but I've reconnected um, with him and his mom and trying to you know trying to help him now. I think he's in a much better place now. Um, tried to reach out to some of our older friends to say, hey, we should make sure that we still connect with them. Um, because one of the big things from talking to his mom was he was he's very worried that the people that he cares about and grew up with are are disappointed in him mm. or or you know or ashamed of him um 
And that's not the case. Like, the last thing we want is for him to feel ashamed. We want him to, hey, we're in your corner. Like, every day know that we're in your corner. We just want you to win today and then win tomorrow. And then and you keep going. And so, um, you know, and this was a, a, a guy that, like I said, I played ball with growing up. He, th- he threw a baseball in the mid-'90s, uh, you know, pitched in college. I mean, great guy, great – loves the game of baseball, was a baseball coach. And so, you know, he's going to get back there. We, you know, the, the people around him just got to help him. We have found out, and, of course, you know it if you've had any life experiences, that addiction's no respecter of persons. That's it right. doesn't care where you are on the ladder of success or failure or finances or lack of the size of your home or anything else, that it's there waiting on you to make that choice as a part of your disease. I am convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt, regardless of what the health system says, and I know they're in agreement with me. Addiction is a disease. Yeah. I am convinced it's a disease that's kicked off by a choice. Yep. Maybe that choice was so ingrained within due to the disease, it was going to be hard to avoid. But there's no such thing as experimenting with drugs. It yep. can be one and done. If nothing else, it's one. And then you can't wait until the next one. Yep. No, you're, you're 100% right. And it it's a disease that is probably the only disease that might be generational, right? It, you, you, some, some folks learn it from their upbringing and the, and their parents that struggle with it, and, um, you know, and that's tough too. Like, how do you, like we, we often talk about our counselors in our group sessions at, at groups that, um, this time of year around the holidays have to talk to their their members about w- what's your plan going to be if you get to. Uncle Joe's house for Thanksgiving, and he's got a bag of stuff that he wants to use with you. Well, what's the plan? Like, are you are you going to be able to do that, or should you maybe not go this year? You know, what what are we going to do? And so, you know, it, it's absolutely a disease, and it's something that um, is so unique, and it's so much different than any other disease uh, because of all those other factors that go along with it. And the stigma and the biases yes. of society. We're going to talk more about that here in a minute. Now, go ahead and tell us about groups. Yeah. I haven't mentioned to the folks, given them any defining, you know, sure. parts of who you are, what you're about. Share with us. Absolutely. So, groups recover together. We are an outpatient opioid use disorder program. So, we, uh, we do uh, weekly group therapy sessions. Um, that are centered around um, Suboxone prescriptions. So we prescribe Suboxone on a weekly basis, and that coincides with that weekly group therapy session. Um, They are meeting with a fully licensed substance use counselor each week. Um, That's an hour-long group. Uh, It's no more than 12 members at a time, so we're not not shuffling in 25, 30 folks to a group session um, where where nothing would really get accomplished. It's, it's a 10- to 12-member group where that counselor is facilitating and trying to help them work through just things like I mentioned before, like maybe triggers or um, or, or issues or, or having a plan for a certain situation. Um, and then those, like I said, those prescriptions that they get of Suboxone, and, that, and Suboxone is the only uh, medication that we prescribe. So we are a medication-assisted treatment program. Um, those are, like I said, they, they coincide with your group attendance. So if a member's not, you know, attending group, they're not going to continue to get their medication. Um, we know that there are things that come up in life. People have kids. Sure. They have, um, they have work. They have, you know, cars break down. So there's going to be instances where somebody legitimately needs to miss their group. Um, and so we've tried to work it in so that we've got... Uh, an opportunity for them to make that up without having to go without their medication. I know there are a lot of folks out there who don't totally understand the MAT, the medically assisted treatment. Sure. Share with us a little bit more of that to help maybe, uh, you know, to help them understand it yeah. better. Uh, yeah. Because I know it carries some biases and stigmas as well. It it does. I I mean I think that you know there's the there's the thought out there that oh you're just replacing one with another and um and and we know that that's not true. We know that 
the medication really helps people stabilize and get to a point where they can focus on what's going on in their life to help them deal with addiction. Um, there's multiple avenues of medication-assisted treatment. So when I say we only prescribe Suboxone, there's some other medications. There's uh, Vivitrol and Methadone that are also medication-assisted treatment. Um, but for the purpose of uh, Suboxone, it is actually a two-part medication. So there's um, buprenorphine, and then there's naloxone. Now naloxone is just like nar is is Narcan. So when you most people have heard and understand that Narcan is something that can block the effects of opioids. Um, the other part of that medication being buprenorphine, that's what you call um, a partial agonist. So drugs like um, like opiates or even methadone, those are um, often referred to as a full agonist. And so they, there are neurotransmitters in the brain, and those accept um, uh, what you call a chemical called dopamine. Yes. And dopamine is what, where, like what the high comes from. So That's we, that natural high that we even get from a basketball game. Exactly. Uh, like scoring that winning shot. Uh, yes. Yes. Go ahead. And yeah, no, absolutely. And that's where that, you know, that feeling of euphoria from, from opiates comes from. Um, that dopamine attaches to those neurotransmitters in the brain. Well, with something like opiates or methadone, it completely engulfs that neurotransmitter. The, the, it just attaches all over it and attracts those those dopamine levels to, to, to just crazy high levels. Buprenorphine, which is in Suboxone, in part with naloxone, it's a partial agonist. So it only attaches to about half of the neurotransmitter. So it, it it's not even capable of creating the high that an opiate or, or a methadone med medication would create. Um, it's uh, if you think about it in terms of a light bulb, um, heroin or methadone would light that light bulb up so bright that it would burst, but buprenorphine would bring it up to about a seventy percent, seventy five percent brightness. So it's a, it's a, it kind of dims it down. It, it 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 so to speak, it it takes the edge off. It curbs the cravings and the urges, and kind of lets people have a clear mind to focus on. What they need to focus on, which is which is recovery and the things that happen in the in the group sessions. Now, that's that is for someone that is an active use, right? Somebody that is actively okay. using opiates, buprenorphine creates that that seventy five percent. If you or I or somebody that's never used opiates tried to use you know use suboxone, it would create a, a feeling of being you know kind of kind of messed up right it would it would definitely it's not for a person that uh is not in active use or trying to to treat their addiction so i think that might be where some of the misconceptions come from because if there's somebody that's never used opiates before and tries to use it it could make them feel pretty intoxicated um it is very much a drug that it, its intention is to um you know, help people curb the use of, of active use in opiates. Hey, Joe, I have a question. Yeah. So Suboxone, it will it will create impairment to someone that is not in active addiction, correct? It, yeah, it absolutely could. Yeah. I mean, it is not it is not something that should just be taken by anybody that's walking down the street that hasn't been, you know, an active user. So is this part of the reason why a lot of the shelters and missions, including the one across the street, the Christian Center, as a policy, we don't accept people on Suboxone or Methadone because it, it's always been a hassle. It, it's something that, you know, it's abused and sold. And Yeah, I mean, I think that that's something that um, that everybody's got to be aware of. That That's even part of our program. We do random pill counts to make sure our members are using the medication and that they have the right amount of, of medication that they're supposed to. Um you know, some diversion is something we take pretty seriously. If we if we find out that somebody's diverting their medication, that would be that's one of the only situations where we would automatically discharge them from the program. Um, and so, it, yeah, it, there is the the opportunity to misuse it, just like you can misuse anything else. Sure. Um, yeah, that th that does exist. Um, I think, and and I was I was talking about this the other day. There's a misconception in a lot of people too because of that. Um, that it that it's not a good medication or that it could make people sick or not feel well. And it's because those things are happening on the street, right? People are selling their medication to somebody else, and it's not the appropriate dose for them. It's, 
it's, right. It's not. It's not right for right. that person. In in the, in our in our situation, people, you know, uh, they'll just say I was right. It came up missing. So they're then they try. They would want to drag a shelter in the middle of this. Well. He said it would come up missing, and and it's just one headache after another. So that's why we're pursuing Vivitrol. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what your thoughts are on Vivitrol, and and I'll stop asking these questions, turn this back over to Randy. I just... No, no, no problem at all. Vivitrol has its place, and it, it is it's a blocker. It doesn't it doesn't have the ability to kind of curb those urges and those cravings like like Suboxone and buprenorphine does. Um, but but Vivitrol does it does work to block the effects of opiates. Um, the one thing that we talk about, though, is that you've got to be pretty motivated on Vivitrol um, because you don't have that curbing of the urges and cravings. Um, you know, a lot of times that's why justice-involved entities will use uh, prefer Vivitrol over Suboxone uh, for, for the obvious reasons. But then also often somebody has like a sentence or some jail time hanging over their head. And so that's a pretty good motivator for uh, somebody to be on Vivitrol and be successful. Our medical director at a national level is looking at research all the time, um, you know, making sure that our, our program is evidence-based and rooted and uh, making sure that we're doing the right things. What we have seen is that there's not the evidence that you can achieve as successful, long-lasting recovery with just those blocker medications. Because at one time we prescribed oral naltrexone, which is, it's not the same as Vivitrol, but it's it's just a blocker. And it's a it's in pill form rather than a shot like Vivitrol is. Much uh, of what you're saying there, Joe, I've got some familiarity with that, certainly not at your level. But we talked early on about the stigma and the bias that goes with medically assisted treatment. Part of me doesn't even want to bring this up. The other sure. <clears throat> The other part of me says it's necessary. I recall not too long ago, there was what we referred to in our level of the business as pill mills, mm -hmm. where you could go for some boxing and they were selling it all day long to multiple people, 12, mm -hmm. 1,500, two or three times a day. And I think the misuse of that, the ease of getting it, the lack of control over those who were receiving it mm -hmm. has brought a, pardon the expression, a black eye to the community of the medically assisted effort. Yes? Yeah, I, I think you're 100% right. And that's, that's dead on. Um, it's something that we're really cognizant of. Um, we know that we've got to do things the right way. Um, you know, we've tried to create a program um, for providers or prescribers to be able to come in and feel comfortable and confident that things are being done the right way. I think when, when those pill mills were happening and a lot of things were going on like that, um, you had some uh, prescribers kind of out there on their own. You know, very much, you know, trying to make as make a quick buck and, and get as many people on it as they can. Um, we've created a program that allows our prescribers to come in and focus on that medication management, be very um, focused on helping their members and taking care of them um, and, and, you know, addressing the, the issues that they face when they're on medication. Like, are you feeling sick? Are, are, how, are, how, have, how have you been doing with your urges and your cravings? We want our prescribers to be able to focus on that while we as the company take care of the, the group sessions and the counseling that wraps around the individual. When you had those pill mills going on, you had people handing out, you know, hey, here's your 30 days worth of pills. See you next month. Go, maybe, maybe they would say go get some counseling, but, but oftentimes it maybe not. Not required. Correct. Correct. And so that's a big that's a big part of why we have those weekly group sessions and it's tied to their prescription each week. It's that seven days worth of medication, not 30. And, you know, because if we were handing out those 30 day scripts, it'd be really easy for members to just not come to their groups except once a month. And so, yes, yes. And I know a lot of them, they had to work their way up to a kind of a, a credit system in the way that they'd give you some each. You had to go each day. Yeah. You'd travel 40 or 50 miles to one of these places each and every day with a vehicle that probably wouldn't make it tomorrow. That's right. And the expense, the continued expense, it became a really expensive effort. And 
then you might get up to where you would get it for a week and then move on from there. Mm -hmm. As you were talking about the suboxone and the transmitters and the receptors, in my mind, and I don't have, once again, I don't have the experience you have, but I have seen over the years there's a major difference in being clean and being clear. Yeah. Uh, I understand after using for really a short time that those transmitters and receptors start to die off. Yes. And then you have to literally be off of any kind of heavy usage for maybe like nine to 14 months. Maybe you can clarify it before those transmitters and those receptors start to revive themselves. Mm -hmm. And that is when you move from being clean to being clear. Yeah. Does that make sense to you? It does. There was actually a study cited a, a few years ago, and I can't cite the study, but I know our, our medical director did, um, that that somebody that, even somebody that has used opiates um, and abused them for six months would be, would most benefit from at least two years of medication-assisted treatment. Um, so, so you're talking even six months of use warrants, 24 months of um, MAT to help them get to the point where they've started to rebuild those connections and get to a point where, um, like you're saying, they're clear again. We would like we like to think, and, and we see it a lot. You know, the members that come in with us and um, and are there for you know 90 days, 180 days is best. But even after 90 days, you really start to see somebody stabilize. Um, and and then we can start working on things like, um, all right, now are all your bills paid? How how are you getting places? Do you have transportation? Or so you move from maybe not so much poor way to put it the the approach toward their health toward all of life's needs. Correct. They're at a point to where they can start to deal with that, handle it, and understand it better. Is that accurate? That's 100 percent accurate, yeah. That, I mean, and that is so much a part of the, of the recovery process. I mean, the medication's great because it helps them stabilize, but all the other factors in their life are what are contributing to them struggling and, and, and trying to get back into recovery and, and staying in recovery. There's so we, we know that the stresses of life are um, so involved and so much more affected when you've also got an addiction to deal with. Oh, I mean, yes, I, I know the stresses of making sure I get all my kids to practice and not <laughs> go sure. to other games and whatnot. But exactly. If I had to add something on top of that, that'd be tough. That addiction, in my mind, is usually the symptom of far deeper needs, problems, issues, challenges. Does that fit? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 So how do we move beyond that? And we've got to start by reducing that need for that drug, by mm -hmm. lessening that, by improvement, you know, moving forward in our recovery. We all know, unfortunately, those who don't know expect recovery to happen overnight. Yeah. It's a snap of a finger. Get over it. Yep. Get out of it. Quit doing it. And I'll bet you... Probably about 100 percent of those who are into it wish it was that easy. Absolutely. I mean, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't if I didn't note and, and mention that there are other ways to recover. Uh, MAT and, and our program with Suboxone, it is not the only way. There are people that have been successful with abstinence. There are people that have been successful with a faith a faith based program and abstinence. Um, it is not one size fits all. Um, <laughs> Don't we wish? Not at We all. wouldn't be here today if that was the case, that's would right. we? That's We'd have right. already had that problem solved. I wouldn't have a job, that's for certain. So Yes. But you know what? But, but, but each one of these avenues and each one of these uh, paths to recovery are valid, and they all serve their purpose. And, you know, they, often uh, Suboxone is, uh, I hear it referred to a lot as the gold standard of treatment. And, it, and it, in a lot of ways it is. But it doesn't mean it's the only way, and it doesn't mean that there's not people out there that can't make the decision to, all right, I'm going to stop. But 
But not everybody's able to do that. Not everybody has the willpower to make that happen. That I way. think it's extremely important that we recognize that. And I totally agree with you that uh, it's different avenues. We got there in different ways. We're not going to get back in the same way. That's right. uh, it's just like when you leave here today, when you head back to Richmond, you may go one direction. I may take another highway to get there, but that's we'll right. both get there. So uh, that's, right. that's part of that recovery effort. Effort. Something that intrigued me, you said a little bit ago, it goes along with the idea, let's let's move aside a little bit from that individual we're helping. Mm-hmm. What would you have to say to their family? Yeah. So you've got that client you're dealing with that's involved with groups. Mm-hmm. If you had a chance to sit down with their, their immediate family and even a half a dozen members of their extended family, what would you tell them? What would you want them to know? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is to to be supportive of them, to be supportive of their efforts, um, to not, to, I, you know, I think uh, you don't want to be afraid to hold people accountable, but that you can be, you can hold somebody accountable and still support them in what they're doing. Um, I think in in today's world, sometimes we're either afraid to hold people accountable. Uh, because maybe we think that it'll sever that relationship or cause ruffles in it, and 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 they don't know how to how to to be able to do that, but also be supportive of what they're going through, and that's sometimes a fine line to walk, but 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 it's so important to to you know you, to to hold them to the fire a little bit, but at the same time say you can do this, you know you you're you're doing a lot of good. Make sure you stick with the good and and don't get slipping into the to the other stuff. And that's that's difficult, you know. It's it's hard to do. I even think about it with my own kids, you know, holding them accountable for certain things isn't always the easiest thing to do. But I know that it's what's best for them in the long run, and being supportive because you don't you don't always want to be hammering down on, on what bet. somebody needs to be doing all the time. You want to tell them what they're doing well as well. And if you're not holding someone accountable, you're oftentimes enabling. Whether yes. that's got to do with drugs and alcohol or that's got to do with your your 12-year-old, your 14-year-old, 7-year-old, whatever, missing school every mm-hmm. other day, and you're letting them do that. That's right. It's not a favor to them in the long run. That's right. Yeah, yeah. What is the biggest, what is the statement you would like to make to to the recovery community, to those in recovery right now? What would you like to say to them? Win each day. You know, each day is a, is a new day and you've got to try to win it. I think, um, you know, and, and winning it might look different each day. You know, to, to, today it might be because uh, you were successful in not using and you stuck with your program and you made all the right choices um, tomorrow it might be you weren't able to make all the right choices, but you recognize that and you move through it and you recognize that it's part of recovery sometimes to mess up, you know, and, and that can be a win. You know, that it's like we talked about earlier. Sometimes the bad things that happen in life are just uh, showing you that there's a, a, a better way and another lesson involved there. Um, and that would that's that's the big thing that I would say to the recovery community. You can win every day even if it doesn't feel like it sometimes. And if you're, if there's not failure along the way, whether it's recovery or whatever it may be in life, then you're not trying hard enough. Right. You're not setting the bar high enough. That's We're right. all going to stumble. And, uh, you know, I have a special affinity and love and respect for those in recovery. But I also recognize that a lot of the behaviors are a part of life and mm-hmm. well above and beyond the drug at times. That's right. And that we've got to recognize recognize that every day is a struggle and the attitude we face it with is going to determine how the end of the day is going to look in very big part. Okay, the other side of that last question I just asked you, what would you like to say? Let's just say we're standing in an auditorium and the people who have gathered are skeptics about recovery, whether it's got to do with MAT or whatever it may be. What would you like to say to the folks in that auditorium? Uh, you know, recognize that everybody's got, like we, we just talked about a little bit ago, everybody's got a different path. Everybody's got a different way forward. Um, just because maybe it hasn't impacted you and your life and the people that you love doesn't mean that it's not happening to others. That, you know, and, and just because maybe you're one of those people that 
that could make the decision to if you if you got into something that you shouldn't, you, maybe you think you're one of those people that can make that decision to just say, "Oh, I'm done with it. I'm cold turkey, and I can I can handle this. I've got enough willpower." It doesn't work that way for everybody. Not everybody um, is able to do that. Not but not everybody's capable of that. Um, some people need extra help. Some people need uh, medicine to get through illnesses. Um, some others don't need as much. Um, I think if if COVID has taught us anything. It's that the disease treats everybody differently. You know, the, the sickness and, and the virus of, of COVID-19 uh, might impact somebody with a stomach flare-up. It might impact somebody else with pneumonia in their lungs. It's a, that's another great way to look at addiction and recovery. It can be completely different for one person versus the other. And we've got to understand that, uh, that that's okay that they are struggling in a different way. And we've got to find other tools to help them fight through it you know if we only find if we only think we got one way we're only going to help so many people i can remember years ago a lady by the name of aretha franklin had a song called r-e-s-p-e-c-t that's right and i think we need to be showing that to those in the struggle we don't have to give them permission as you said earlier we've got to hold them accountable but there's a right way and a wrong way to do that are you doing it to attack or are you doing it to help are you doing it to beat them down where they don't need to be any longer or is it a way of trying to lift them up yeah 100 percent. like help them Help them work through it. I, you know, the other the other option for somebody is that they end up falling back into addiction. So, you know, that's often, you know, groups takes a, a, a harm reduction model. Like we, we support harm reduction. Like um, the alternative to being on your Suboxone and attending groups every week is to be back in the streets using heroin and fentanyl. We would much rather you be in group and using your Suboxone even if there's stigma attached to that, because we know that that's not going to kill you. Uh, Explain to the folks the harm reduction model in general. Kind of define that, because I'm sure there are those who don't, you know, who haven't heard of it or aren't aware of what it actually means. Yeah, I I mean, I think the best way to to, to phrase it, and for me even probably, is it's, it's not a punitive approach. It's not, oh, you tested positive for certain substances on your urine screen this week. And we and I don't know that I mentioned that. We do do weekly urine screens that coincide with each group each week. So we are checking, you know, to see if they're, A, if they've, they're using the medication, the buprenorphine, Suboxone, and then, B, are there other th- drugs that they might be using outside of opiates. But when we see those screens each week, it's not, oh, you tested positive, you're out of here, sorry, it's not working for you. It's it's a harm reduction model in that we want to help you figure out how to keep this from happening again. Like, let's talk about how we're going to, um, you know, keep you in a positive place in your recovery. How are we going to get back on track? Not, you messed up, you're out of here. And And it's created a culture for us at groups where people aren't afraid to let us know. You know, they're not afraid. They don't they don't try to falsify their screens. They don't um, try to pull one over on us because they know we're going to help them work through it. We're not going to punish them and kick them out. Is is a part of harm reduction the final goal, even if it's not stated? Is it abstinence? Uh, Yes. Help me with that. Yeah. So, I mean, harm reduction is. Is, is ultimately we would hope that we can help everybody achieve abstinence. Now, to we, but we've also got to be realistic about that. There might be some people that come to us uh, at groups to be in our Suboxone program that have been in a Suboxone program with, a, with their doctor for 25, 30 years. And it might not be realistic to think that they're going to completely taper off the medication, you know, in, in a couple of years. We, we've got a goal um, of 18 to 36 months. We hope that from the time somebody starts with us, that between 18 and 36 months, we can help them taper off of the Suboxone. That is not always the case. Like I mentioned before, there might even be a situation where somebody's been in, in on a Suboxone prescription with a doc for 25 years, and they come to us and they say, I'm ready to try and live my life without this. That doesn't mean we're going to make them wait 18 months to taper off the medication. We're going to work with them. We're going to help them um, work through that process between the counselor and our prescriber. Okay, well, let's talk about this. What's this look like? You know, maybe we should try to take a couple milligrams off for a little while and see how you feel. If if you 
If you start that and you don't feel so well, we can bump back up for a little while. You know, we've got to help everybody achieve that at their own pace. We've got to help them work through it. And on the flip side of that, when we get down to that, when we get to that 36th month, you know, you might have somebody that was, you know, on the streets, homeless, lost their children to DCS, had no job, was, you know, at the end of the rope. And now three month, three years later, you know, in large part in their mind, because of Suboxone, now they've got their kids back. They got a job. They've got a stable place to live. And so many things are going on well in their life. The thought of coming off the medication scares them to death. And so if we've helped them taper down to the last couple milligrams, you know, that's as very much as much about, you know, their psyche and their psychological thoughts as it is the physical side of it. So we've got to protect that as well. We've got to help them. Absolutely. We're back to that idea we've talked over and over today, that individual journey for the individual person. We can't just rubber stamp everybody's recovery and victory. It's going to come at a different speed in a different way. We just want it to come. If they can reach abstinence, hooray, that would be the ultimate goal, the dream. But if they can get to where they're far better than they are and much more the person God created them to be, We're going to celebrate with them each and every day. That's right. Joe, let's kind of wrap this up. Let me ask you a question here. Yeah. Let's look down the road. What do you see as the future, either with MAT or any kind of recovery? Where do you see the overall recovery movement five, ten years from now? Do you have a vision for that? A little bit, yeah. You know, I've I've been with groups for— just over four years now. For my four-year uh, window was uh, at the end of November, and I have seen a, a shift in, oh in the acceptance and, and the and the level of stigma has come down so much in a four-year time period that I hope that that trend continues. I hope that we continue to see our community and our state support people in their recovery, whatever, like we said, whatever path it is. We've got, you know, Groups is a pretty large company. Indiana is our actually our biggest state. We're going to have 35 sites, offices in Indiana um, by the end of this year and a, and a couple more coming on next year. We're also in 12 other states. And so, I can see some of the states that we're just breaking into and we just got new offices. The stigma is still very alive and well there. It it almost feels like, oh, I remember in Indiana when we were when we were dealing with that two or three years ago. Right. And so continuing to break down those walls, continuing to to help uh, people understand that, like everything we've talked about today, there's other avenues. There's there's respectable ways to do this. I hope that we continue to to break those walls down. I hope that We continue to pull more people in that have struggled with addiction. I think the peer recovery coach has been, it's been huge for people. It gives them somebody that kind of acts as a mentor and a support and helps them allocate resources to deal with their recovery. I think that's huge. We've actually hired a couple of those at groups. We've, we've got one in Kokomo and one in Lawrenceburg. And I hope that if we come back and talk again in five years, that we have a peer recovery coach at every single one of our offices because of the support and and maybe multiples at every office would be great just to continue to wrap around uh, our members to to address those other issues. By all means, and I'll tell you something that you've touched on, this is going to be a tender spot for some, but I'm going to go ahead and mention it and I'll take the rap. You don't even have to touch it, okay? We talk about the stigma and the bias from society toward that struggler, that individual dealing with addiction. But I have come to realize there's also a little bit of it that heads from the addiction side to the rest of us. I've heard up more than once. If you haven't been here, you can't talk to me. Mm -hmm. If you haven't been where I'm at, you can't begin to relate. You told me earlier on, you told our listeners early on, you don't come Mm -hmm. with the need of addiction recovery. We all need recovery, but you don't have that battle going on. Neither do I. But I have a passion that will lead me beyond some of those things I may not know. And I've got two ears that if I listen with my heart through them both, yeah, I can relate. I'm not saying that others can't talk to you in a different way, perhaps even a more effective way. 
But I've been at this now for a while, caring and sharing, and we're seeing incredible things happen. I'm listening to you. I'm getting the same thing from you. So let's make sure that we're being fair from both sides, if you'll pardon that expression, and that we come together with that. So anything you'd like to say in closing here? No, I I just really appreciate the time and and being able to come in and talk to you today. I think think you just nailed it. There's there's so many people that are affected by this. It it doesn't mean that they have to be in recovery to to be wanting and willing to help somebody. Um, And you never know what perspective somebody's going to offer. And so... Um, being open to to receiving that help from anybody that's willing to give it is so important. So, But thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Don't give up on yourself and don't give in to the urge. Your answer, your healing, your recovery may be in our next episode. Have faith in your recovery by having faith in yourself, your journey, and above all, God. Believe and stay in the fight. <music>